It is now time to proceed with the SIU opening panel, Energy Transformation in ASEAN, which will be presented by Shell. It is with pleasure that I invite our moderator for this panel discussion, ladies and gentlemen, the Director of Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, Yusuf Ishak Institute, Mr. Choi Shing Kwok. Let's invite him up on stage, our moderator. Good to have you. And as he makes his way up on stage, ladies and gentlemen, I take pride in inviting up our panelists. We have His Excellency Alfonso Cusi, Secretary of Energy Philippines, His Excellency Yo Bin Yin, Minister of Energy, Science, Technology, Environment and Climate Change, Malaysia, Dr. Kopo Kun, Senior Minister of State, Ministry of Trade and Industry, Singapore, Dato Lane Lo, Vice President, Commercial and New Business Development Asia, Integrated Gas and New Energy Shell, Martin J. Houston, Vice Chairman Tellurian, and Girish Tanti, Co-Founder and Director of Suzlon Energy. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give our panelists a welcoming round of applause, shall we? Again, would like to ask you to pose the questions on Pigeonhole Live. And of course, as mentioned at the very start of my presentation right here, we have microphones at hand as well. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll now hand over the floor to Mr. Choi. Enjoy the session. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this opening panel. I'm very privileged to be able to moderate this panel. I think we have a very, very exciting uh, panel for all of us. We have in this panel three ministers from very different countries. One country that is fully urbanized and energy highly disadvantaged, that's Singapore. We also have a country that is much more of a mixture of rural and urban populations. And it is a net energy importer, that's Philippines. And we have Another country that's kind of in between as far as rural and urban is concerned, about 75% urbanized, but an energy exporter still, although it's declining, and that's Malaysia. And we also have three very uh, distinguished corporate leaders of also very different global energy companies. One which I will say is a very traditional company, <laughs> Shell, but it has been moving into new areas one that is uh, very much in uh, the more carbon-friendly gas, and then uh, one that is in totally into renewables, that is into wind. The topic for this panel is on energy transformation in ASEAN. We all know, and I think uh, the MC has reminded us again, that the ASEAN region is one of the fastest growing regions in the world, and indeed, it is making its way up the leak table of the size of economies measured by GDP. Uh, the MC mentioned that it's the sixth in the poll, but actually, I think if you look at the latest uh, pound conversion rates, it actually may be the fifth, having overtaken the UK. Uh, this growth that the region is experiencing requires a lot of energy for the industries, for the transportation, and for household consumption. So ASEAN is, of course, we know, very, very diverse in every dimension. Different stages of growth, different energy resource endowments, and also in terms of the geographical spread of its population. But they all face the same challenges going into the future. Challenges which we have been reminded on earlier by the speakers today. They need to deliver large amounts and higher quality energy to meet the growing needs of the countries and the company at affordable prices. They need to deal with climate change, which will require the use of lower carbon fuels, higher energy efficiency, and also increasing the use of renewables, such as solar, wind, and possibly biofuels. They also need to cope with the vast array of technological changes that are becoming uh, apparent in so many areas like smart grids, renewables, batteries, extraction methods, and so on. So all countries will have to transform their energy landscape, 
there is no choice. The question is only how they can do it best individually and also as a region. So our panel will give us insights into how they are tackling these problems uh, as energy ministers that set the policies within their own countries and also how they contribute to that within ASEAN as a bloc. And we also will hear from companies who are delivering the products, developing the technologies to help address these transformation needs. Our first speaker, and I will invite him to give uh, a three to five minute opening remarks, is uh, Dr. Ko Po Kun, a senior minister of state for the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Singapore. He's a medical doctor and surgeon by training. He has uh, set up specialist hospitals. He has set up medical centers. He has served as a lecturer in a medical school, a professor, and a clinical scientist. And he gave up all that three years ago to enter politics and was immediately put into political office in two ministries. His other appointment, other than trade and industry, is in the Ministry of National Development, looking after the favorite topic of Singaporeans, and that is food. So, Dr. Ko, please. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this morning for this uh, discussion. Now, I don't know why I'm talking about energy as a doctor, but I suppose <laughs> it must be because you need a lot of energy to be running around doing so many things. But uh, energy is my portfolio at the Trade and uh, Industry Ministry. And uh, here in Singapore, I, I suppose our, our key energy generating source is uh, through natural gas. 95% or more of the energy we generate in Singapore is through natural gas, um, with a smaller proportion of it through solar energy as the only renewable source at this moment that is uh, commercially viable here in Singapore. And of course, we are committed to increasing that proportion of renewable energy um, from now about maybe 100 over to 200 gigawatt peak to more than a to megawatt peak to more than a one gigawatt peak by 2020 and beyond. So we hope to be able to encourage more players to come into the ecosystem, but importantly, to make sure that we solve the energy trilemma of reliability, sustainability, and affordability, we need to do what that title behind the wall says, to invest, to innovate, and to integrate. And this is where Singapore is putting a lot of efforts into incentivizing R&D into uh, solar efficiency, into battery storage, and finding collaboration with like-minded partners in this field to expand the possibilities of innovation, to discover solutions that will help us to solve this trilemma. Um, we know in Asia, in Southeast Asia at least, the need for energy is going to continue to grow. The need for LNG will continue to grow because today, Southeast Asia is uh, going to be a net importer of LNG because of the energy demands that will keep growing. It's projected that by 2035 onwards, we will need probably up to five uh, billion cubic meters of uh, LNG gas uh, per day, while in the supply of, of gas in Southeast Asia is declining at 2% per year. So here we're looking at the fact that the net production is decreasing, but the net demand is going up. And Singapore being dependent on, on uh, gas for our energy generation needs, will naturally be concerned about how we can make this energy source more resilient in our region. So Singapore tries to play a useful role in this aspect by being a price discovery center for LNG with our Singapore LNG Index. So that helps to create some degree of uh, transparency in the way we price energy. Um, we try to also play a useful role by helping to perhaps facilitate and catalyze some of these inf energy infrastructure development in the region because as part of our uh, kind of trust to integrate the region, Economically, we want to push for ASEAN Smart Cities Network. We want to push for ASEAN e-commerce uh, as a platform to, to help our businesses to prosper and to go into each other's markets. But clearly, e-commerce and smart cities require energy to power your devices and your energy needs. And as more ASEAN cities urbanize, we see the need for energy infrastructure in the regional countries to also increase. And Singapore being a financial hub where there are a lot of multilateral development banks are based here in Singapore, where a lot of ecosystem players here with the technology know-how and the, uh, the business know-how are also co-located within Singapore, mm -hmm. we believe we can play a useful role to catalyze some of these uh, project structuring. So we set up Infrastructure Asia office this year to bring together stakeholders and partners in the ecosystem to ensure that uh, the needs in the region 
are met from the supply side by ecosystem players, structuring the financing, which I think many ministers brought out yesterday at the meeting in the ASEAN ministers' meeting, that project structuring and financing is a key problem. Many of the projects, are, there are needs for these projects, but yet bankability and financing is a key issue. So by bringing together these ecosystem players, we hope that Infrastructure Asia office will be able to do project financing, project management, making these long-term energy projects that actually has definite returns bankable and allowing infrastructure to become uh, more easily available in the regional countries that helps to uplift the entire ASEAN, and that is also good for Singapore. So this is the, hopefully the useful role that Singapore hopes to play, and we look forward to participation and uh, collaboration and also suggestions from our various member countries and stakeholders on how we can do this better together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Ko. I think that was very prompt and on time. Now let me, the uh, second speaker is the Honourable Alfonso Cusi, Secretary of the Energy for the Philippines. He has uh, had a very distinguished business and public career, mainly in transportation and logistics, spanning four decades. On the business side, he has founded and run companies in shipping, logistics, distribution, and maritime engineering. In the public sector, he has done everything possible on the transportation side. He has run the Philippines Port Authority, he has run the Manila International Airport Authority, as well as the Civil Aviation Authority before assuming his current cabinet position. So, Secretary Kuzi, over to you. Uh, allow me <coughs> first, uh, please, to read my opening statement. <laughs> uh, my pe uh, fellow panelists and uh, our moderator, Mr. Choi, distinguished members of the energy industry, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Never has there been a, a time such as now when all stakeholders have shown the demonstrated a great effort towards uh, meeting their environmental mandates. While developed countries have been leading the, chi the charge in the fight against climate change, as outlined in their COP21 commitments, it has been a challenge for many developing countries to meet their goals. This challenge is best articulated by the, by the energy trilemma of balancing energy security, energy equity, and environmental sustainability. I am proud to say that Philippines has performed extremely, extremely, extremely well in environmental sustainability. For four consecutive years, we have been ranked number one globally on the World Energy Council's Energy Trilemma Index. Currently, renewable energy comprises 31.1% of our energy mix, a remarkable achievement given that energy is not subsidized in the Philippines. We were able to achieve this by being an early adopter, riding, riding the wave ahead of the developing world. But our success comes at a trade-off. We have not done well when it comes to energy security at 70, 70th place and ener energy equity at 96th place. As we watch our neighbors announce record foreign investment figures, the Philippines trails behind, behind due to high electricity rates. Some have argued that we have not benefited from our push for sustainability. However, I believe that this situation presents the, an opportunity. We have introduced the Green Energy Option Framework, enabling companies to source their energy requirements directly from our abundant renewable energy sources. This is a ch chance for firms to make a long-term commitment towards a sustainable future. We must be decisive and act now before momentum is lost. My fear is that without the buy-in from the investment community, the Philippines may be forced to make choices that result in short-term payoffs over long-term gains. This brings us to energy security. How do we plan for f our future energy landscape? In the Philippines, we project that we will need 43 gigawatt hours, gigawatt of additional capacity by 2040. While we need more capacity, we must also consider what sources of energy we want. With this in mind, we have adopted an, a technology-neutral policy to spur capacity building and diversification of our energy mix. As we continue to explore new indigenous resources, we are also looking at to position the Philippines as the LNG gateway for the region. The surging demand for cleaner fuel in Asia has shifted us towards becoming a net importer of LNG. This places the Philippines as the nexus of LNG shipping routes. From America, 
shale gas exports, as well as regional producers and consumers. This means that we will be able to import LNG for our domestic supply while being an access point for moving LNG to other importers in the region. While we consider the bigger picture of security, we cannot lose sight of energy equity, where we face the twin challenges of accessibility and affordability. It is important to appreciate and understand that Philippines is an archipelago of over 7,000 islands. Geographically, this is a huge challenge. One in 10 Filipinos live without access to electricity. My instincts suggest we have a viable solution, hybrid microgrid system. We have successfully deployed solar microgrids in remote off-grid areas where connecting them to a main transmission backbone is costly and time-consuming. In Paluan, Occidental Mindoro, a 6-megawatt hybrid system consisting of 2-megawatt solar panels, 2-megawatt batteries, and 2-megawatt diesel backup generators have been deployed, supplying clean energy 24 by 7. This is a high-impact, affordable, and sustainable solution. Ladies and gentlemen, as we proceed to the question and answer session, I, took, I look forward to going into more detail about the future of energy in the Philippines. As a final note, let me congratulate the government of Singapore for its successful and hosting of the 11th Singapore International Energy Week. I'm personally honored to have been a part of this event. Thank you and a good day to everyone. Thank you, Secretary Kuzi. Our third speaker is Minister Yeo Bi Yin. She is the Minister for Energy, Science, Technology, Environment, and Climate Change of Malaysia. A chemical engineer by training, she won her first state legislator seat five years ago at the age of 29. In the remarkable general election that took place in Malaysia earlier this year, she switched to a federal seat in her home state of Johor and won the highest majority ever in that seat. Shortly after that, she was appointed to the cabinet, leading this gigantic ministry that is such a mouthful. And it's actually an amalgamation of uh, three ministries, but with some pieces uh, cut off to form other ministries. This is due recognition of her many talents and capabilities, not least of which I believe is her strong and highly commend commendable passion for the environment. Minister Yeo, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Choi. Uh, hi, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Yeo Bin. I'm the Minister of uh, Energy, Science, Technology, Environment and Climate Change. Uh, it's very mouthful like what Mr. Choi said. Um, the Prime Minister, Tun Mahathir, likes to call me Minister of Many Functions uh, because I have many portfolios. But one of the most challenging portfolios, I think, uh, would be energy. I remember the first day when we were eating together with other ASEAN energy ministers. One of the things we discussed about is how do we make an announcement of energy price hike? Because every time, every six months in Malaysia, or every three months in Singapore, uh, you have got to announce. And people cannot remember when you announce that it's a drop. That the people always remember when it's a hike. So there is a, it's very challenging to be in a, a, as an energy minister. But at the same time, I always ask myself, although I am very short in the office, I've always asked this, is that as... Uh, as a capacity of energy minister, of many of you here who are experts in energy sectors, uh, whether it is in uh, oil and gas or in electricity field, that many of us here are always discussing about cost reflective. Uh, many of us here are always discussing about what is the market price and always about um, how to announce a price hike. But I have always uh, remind myself that I am in politics, or I am in public service for this. It's that I remember when I was young, my mom goes to grocery, went to grocery shops and he, she needed to, uh, uh, to, to owe money to the grocery uncle, uh, grocery um, shop owners for like two weeks before, before his sal uh, salary came in. I always remember that because even as we act as an expert or as a minister, people of high places make a choice of energy price or the cost of the technology. We have got to always remember that eventually, who will be the most affected will be those that need a little of money from them 
for grocery and for daily necessities. So, so that, is, uh, that is what I've reminded. So I have been a minister for um, about four months now. Um, I just passed 100 days. Um, uh, and in, in Malaysia, we actually do um, energy minister takes care of only electricity sector. Uh, let me just uh, give you a little bit of update of what we have done so far and what is uh, the direction moving forward. There are three things I would like to share with you here. Today, um, first of all, uh, in the electricity industry in Malaysia, uh, we have reactivated My Power as an agency for three years market structure reform. Because whenever we have very limited resources, we have to always ask ourselves whether or not it is actually efficiently or effectively used. Um, so we are going through a market structure reform. Um, we have a liberalized generation part, but in the transmission and distribution part, there is still a lot of room to grow, we would like to put into more competition across the value chain in electricity supply. That will be the first uh, market structure reform. And the second thing, and even in market structure, we are looking into how do we optimize our reserve margin. For example, there are one thing, um, recently I've just made an announcement of cancelling four uh, independent power producers. Um, because we want to reduce our reserve margin in, uh, in our electricity supply. And with that, we, can, we have saved the electricity users 1.2 billion ringgit Malaysia um, for, for all our electricity users. That is first market structure reform. The second thing that we are going ahead is renewable energy. We would like to increase our renewal, renewable energy electricity generation mix from 2% to 20% by 2025 that is excluding large hydro. If we are looking into large hydro, Malaysia will heat and has a target of 40% of renewable energy in electricity generation mix. We have also recently announced two new policies on that. Uh, the first one, of course, is fee-in tariff. Fee-in tariff, solar panels and solar energy is no longer in a fee-in tariff regime. Uh, we have announced 140 megawatt of uh, new uh, renewable energy uh, fee-in tariff for 75% hydro, small hydro, and 10% biomass, 30% on uh, biogas. And then uh, now we are also looking into net energy metering. We are entering into a one-to-one -one energy metering. I've just announced it last week on this. Uh, recently, previously, our net energy metering is uh, on a displaced cost uh, that is 31 cent, that's 31 cent per kilo hour ringgit uh, ringgit and then versus your tariff that is about 50 cents. So now we are moving into a regime of one-to-one -one, and also we are moving into a regime of solar leasing. Um, through um, supply agreement of renewable energy. So this will unlock a lot of potential of, of rooftop solar behind the meter electricity generation. And um, just give you an example of rooftop solar, the potential of rooftop solar in Malaysia. There is about 3.2 million terrace house in Malaysia. 1,000 shopping malls, Malaysian like shopping, like <laughs> Singaporean. Um, and 450,000 uh, factories, uh, 90,000 factories and 450,000 of shop lots. We have a lot of roofs. And solar energy has always been about land. And we want to unlock the potential of rooftop solar behind the meter. The third thing that we are looking at is energy efficiency. So we are looking at the energy efficiency. There is one study on, uh, by, that is done by the Economic Planning Unit and also United Nations uh, Development Program where energy efficiency, if we can actually unlock the potential and really by all sectors and transport, thermal and electricity, if we are managed to do and increase our, uh, the, the, the potential of our energy efficiency improvement is 46 billion ringgit Malaysia from 2016 to 2030. That is a lot, a big market. It's about 10, uh, 10 billion US dollar kind of uh, potential. So we would like to unlock that through our Energy Efficiency Conservation Act, uh, which will be tabled next year, and we are still in the process of tabling, uh, of, of drafting it. Another potential for next year, 2019, on in Malaysia, electricity uh, industry landscape is this, is that the government is moving into a building uh, energy efficiency projects where we are energy uh, buildings actually eats up about 50% of electricity needs in Malaysia and um, there is a lot of room for growth for energy efficiency for buildings so the government wants to lead by example by retrofitting our, our 50 of our government buildings that will be about 200 million ringgit uh, 
project value. That's about 50 US dollar. So we are looking into that. We are also reviewing our co-gen, co-generation policy, uh, of which we will be also table in the next round. That, that would be a little bit of update uh, from me, from Malaysia. Thank you very much. And uh, our fourth speaker is Dato Ian Lo. He is the chairman of Shell Malaysia, as well as the vice president for commercial and new business development in Asia in the upstream and integrated gas area. Uh, he's a civil engineer by training. He spent almost 30 years in the company, spending time in The Hague, in Singapore, and in Malaysia. He's a native of Sarawak. I understood from his CV that he supports na local nature projects there, and he also serves on the board of Singapore's EDB, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> so, Mr. Lowe, please, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Choi, and thank you for the in invitation to speak in this distinguished panel. Um, I'd like to start, perhaps, with some beliefs uh, and drawing from this morning's uh, conversation as well. Um, you know, I and Shell have a belief that uh, the Paris Agreement is possible, and we have developed uh, a scenario, it's called Sky. Uh, you heard Mr. John Abbott refer to it earlier. It is the most optimistic scenario under which you know, the Paris uh, agreements are met. Um, but what it will require is quite unprecedented collaboration between governments, business, and civil society. Uh, the other th belief is you know, something to reiterate from this morning, is that whilst, you know, Electrification will grow massively, as uh, Mr. Uh, Birol showed. Uh, it is also only a small part of the global energy system. I think it's 20% he mentioned. Uh, under our sky scenario, that grows to 50% by 2070. So it says that, you know, out to 2070, you will still have quite a lot of hydrocarbons. So, you know, I think the big takeaway is that hydrocarbons will still remain important. And it is because there are certain sectors of the economy where electrification just doesn't work. You heard about heavy transport, air transport this morning, but also steel, cement, glass, petrochemicals. These are the foundations of the cities we live in and our economy. And these things cannot easily be electrified. Um, <coughs> So what is the approach that Shell is taking? I think the first thing is that we are taking care of our own house to make sure that our own carbon footprint is uh, minimized and that the efficiency of our assets are at the top quartile of the class of assets that we operate. But, you know, we've gone a bit further and our CEO has stated our ambition to reduce our net carbon footprint by 50% by 2050. Uh, that is quite a big statement because the calculation of that includes not only our own emissions, but the emissions that come from using our products. So if you believe that you know, there will still be a lot of hydrocarbons, and consuming hydrocarbons generate electricity, uh, sorry, uh, generate uh, CO2 emissions, then it is quite important to find a way to remove these hydrocarbons if you're going to get to a net zero position from the energy systems. So, you know, in addition to looking for more efficient ways of producing oil and gas, more affordable ways of producing oil and gas, we are also working on how do you remove CO2 uh, from, you know, some of the, the use of our products. And there, we are working on two specific areas. One is carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, so that requires us to be able to separate out the CO2 in the first place, <coughs> whether it's from a contaminated stream of gas or whether it comes from flue gas from burning gas in a power station, purifying that stream and then uh, sequestering it. And the sequestration technology we're working on is actually injecting it into aquifers or depleted reservoirs. So such a project uh, is happening in Canada. Uh, it's called Quest. So we're investing quite a bit of money in there. Uh, the other reason for doing this is because, you know, in, in Southeast Asia, 
there is quite a big resource of gas that is contaminated with CO2. Uh, there is one actually right near here uh, called East Natuna that belongs to uh, Indonesia that has between 60 or 70 percent of CO2. But it is a massive resource of gas. So how do you make that economic and how do you bring it to market is part of the challenge that we are looking at because beyond Natuna in Malaysia, there's also a lot of contaminated gas, <coughs> uh, which you know, we are exploiting the ones uh, with low CO2, but we know that there is a lot more of higher CO2. So being able to uh, bring that to market in a cost-efficient way, but also in an environmentally friendly way is, is what we're doing. Um, so, you know, I think Shell's probably biggest contribution to the energy transition is to increase the role of use of gas. Now, my colleague John has spoken eloquently already about what we do in the downstream, but in the upstream space, continued exploration is quite important. We heard the ministers talk about, you know, the amount of gas being produced in Southeast Asia is declining. Well, actually, we are the ones who are spending the most money <coughs> in Malaysia, in Brunei, and hopefully in the Philippines to look for more gas so that we can continue supplying gas to this region. The other areas we're working on, of course, is biofuels. Uh, you heard John talk about that. I won't repeat it, but some examples of, of the biofuels that we're looking at uh, is obviously from bioethanol and biodiesel. Uh, but we're also working on the new generation technology. John mentioned I squared. He, he, he talked about it very briefly. Maybe I'd like to say a little bit more about that. Uh, this is a technology that takes uh, <laughs> city waste and converts it to fuel. And it's a second generation technology. And, and you know, one of the great things about this is that in future, we will not be able to use products from the food chain to convert that to energy. Um, we're working on many things, but one of the conclusions is that, you know, it will require all of these things in order to help us meet the Paris commitments and not just one solution. Thank you very much. Sorry to have to cut you short, okay. but uh, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Martin Houston, who's the co-founder and vice chairman of Tellurian. Uh, he spent more than 30 years working in the BG Group I think it's formerly called British Gas, and he retired as a COO and a board member in 2014. And in 2016, he founded the current company, Tellurian, and is involved in LNG projects all around the world. Mr. Houston, please. Thank you, Mr. Choi, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so you asked um, in your preamble what it is that companies like ours do to satisfy the needs of the ASEAN companies. And you know, as uh, Mr. Lowe has said so eloquently, it's really, as far as I'm concerned, to provide low-cost natural gas for power generation as well as for domestic, commercial, and industrial use. Um, and the key here is that, you know, as we talk about um, renewables, and, and we talk about them, you know, very positively and with great passion, you know, we still have not got down to the solution for renewables being the end of the journey that was set about uh, on the energy transition. So. You know, whilst we have ambitious targets from Thailand, from the Philippines, and, and as stated um, from Minister Yeo here in, the, in Malaysia too, you know, battery technology is not there yet, and renewables still have some way to go uh, to count one megawatt of generated power as being a real substantial 24-hour uh, megawatt of consumption. Um, Look, we, the, the costs are uh, converging, um, and it's, it's remarkable to me how the costs of particularly photovoltaics are, are, are really getting almost under uh, long-term CCGT, but it's still not there yet. We still have some way to go on cost and on technology as well. So all the things are lining up. There's a desire, there's a mandate, there's a target, uh, there's passion to do it, but we don't quite have the technological uh, development yet. So companies like mine um, have a responsibility, in my view, to provide a low-cost uh, aid to that transition. So as we look at the transition fuels, it should be a combination, in my view, of, uh, of gas and renewables. And that would be a pretty straightforward combination of low-carbon, low you know, low hydrocarbon, 
uh, and a sort of very low carbon or zero carbon renewables. But it doesn't work that way. That's not the way the world is shaping up. The world is shaping up that the renewables partner in many parts of the world has turned out to be coal. And so this, you know, as I've said many times before in, in, in uh, events like this, the Faustian bargain between coal and renewables is not the right answer. And it's something that the advocacy of both the industry and, of course, uh, governments has to, has to counter if we're going to get to the lowest cost solution as we get to the, the end of the, the journey that we are looking for. Now, part of, this, part of this solution, in my view, is liquefied natural gas. I was just talking to the, um, the secretary from the Philippines about their own ambitions uh, with LNG imports in, into the Philippines. Four or six ASEAN countries now have uh, LNG importation facilities, either permanent or, or FSIU. And this is democratizing gas and bringing it uh, in relatively low cost form into markets that have run out of gas, are running out of gas. You know, Malampaya, you know, being a great example in the Philippines, has been replaced by long term LNG. And I, and I think the, the, the point I really wanted to make without um, consuming too much of the time available is that the, the United States, where, where I'm based, um, is ready to serve these markets. Um, if, you, you know, if you talk to the administration, uh, the Trump administration, and companies like mine which are developing these shale resources, there is a strong desire to export. And the cost of production today is down to levels that you would find very, very difficult to imagine. Um, you know, uh, we don't have a levelized cost of global LNG for obvious reasons. It's a commercially irrational fuel, as it happens, uh, and has been for most of its uh, gener you know, for most of its life uh, for, for, for the last 50 years. But right now, the U.S. is capable of delivering into these markets at six dollars, more or less flat, and this is the, the you know the most recent and emergent model of LNG being a cost plus. Um, so, uh, cost plus offering as opposed to uh, the, the various uh, commodity linked um, opportunities that have been used for many years up to now. So I'll leave it there, um, Mr. Choi, but just to say, you know, the US is the panacea and it is open for business. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Houston. Now I'd like to call upon our last speaker, Mr. Girish Tanti. He is the co founder and director of Suslon Energy. Founded in 1995, although I was told earlier that it started actually investing in wind in the 1980s. Uh, this company is India's largest and one of the world's most admired wind energy companies. The company has won numerous awards and already has 17 gigawatts of wind power operating all across six continents, a truly global energy, renewable energy corporation. So, Mr. Tanti, please. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, just to put some of the numbers, uh, you know, I was reading this morning that uh, for the ASEAN countries, almost uh, by 2025, we expect uh, our energy demand to almost double. And uh, considering the fuel source that we have in various countries, uh, there's not going to be enough indigenous uh, fuel for different uh, countries across uh, ASEAN. And... Uh, with the current approach of energy generation that we have, it, it looks that the projections say that almost the cost of pollution uh, during this period up to 2025 is going to cost us almost 5% of GDP for the region. And, uh, you know, about uh, the CO2 that's going to be emitted during this period also is going to grow almost by 60% if the plans as currently thought forward. Uh, it's good to see that uh, there is a significant goal put also for renewables in that plan, that from current about 9% that we have in the region to grow it to 23. So it's a, it's a good goal to have. And uh, what I would like to state basically is that uh, today, both uh, in the maturity curve, both for wind and solar, we have reached a stage where... Uh, they are commercially competitive uh, if a level playing field is given in any country. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that our 
uh, energy markets and our growth across various geographies have happened on conventional energy sources. And therefore, the entire system is suited for that. And unless there is conviction from the governments to make the transition happen, uh, because that is the long-term future, uh, the transition has to happen. And the quicker we can get there, uh, the better. Uh, and it's going to be, you know, we'll be basically living a better place for our children. Uh, so from that point of view, at least for wind and solar, uh, today we have reached a stage, and to state you an example, uh, with the very high goals that uh, the government of India has put for renewables in uh, for next uh, five-year plan, uh, wind and solar today are the cheapest source of energy in India than any other conventional energy also. So we have achieved it. And there's no government support, no financial subsidies, nothing. A lot of misnomer, but nothing is there. So in a free market, having equal uh, platform, uh, which government had a bold move to do it, today, in the last five years, the largest uh, energy generation, new energy generation that has come on stream in India has actually come from wind and solar. So with the scale and volume, things can change very quickly. And uh, I would just like to leave uh, thought uh, to the governments here that basically the industry is ready. Uh, if the environment is provided, we have the technologies, and uh, you know, we are able to serve in whatever challenging uh, environments or uh, situations that you put us. We'll be happy to work with private sector as well as governments to make the transition as quick as possible. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to uh, turn to the questions now in the very little time that we have left. <laughs> I would like to give priority to people who will be bold enough to put up your hands and get the mic. Uh, so there's one over there. Um, is there any others? If not, I will be reading something from the pigeonhole. Yes, please. Uh, two, two questions. First of all, uh, for the ministers, how much of a role do you see China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative investment in um, expanding uh, access to energy and developing energy infrastructure in your countries? And second question to Mr. Houston, uh, that how much do you see uh, tit-for-tat uh, tariffs and trade disputes affecting LNG trade flows from the US? Could you repeat the second question? I'm not sure everybody got, caught it. it. You caught it's it? The, 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 the first the question is the one that we caught. The first question well. was about a Belt and Road Initiative that China has and how that uh, is going to play into the energy scene in this part of the world. Okay. Uh, so those, those, uh, the second question I actually didn't quite catch, but it had to do with LNG, tip right? For that, tip for yeah. that. Uh, but let me just add one more question before I turn it over to all of you, which comes from the uh, pigeon hole. And uh, someone has asked about uh, thermal, geothermal energy. I think this has been mentioned earlier today, but not quite uh, mentioned in our panel so far. Uh, do we believe that this is a, a source? Can it be a bigger uh, source in the mix? And also, uh, how can it help to reduce dependency on gas? I think that is what the question is. And maybe just to throw it, one more question that's from uh, Pigeon Ho is about the Pan ASEAN grid. If you could say something about that. Okay, so, uh, so those, those four questions, uh, anyone can start. Who, who would like to start? Uh, Minister Ko, you'd like? Can okay, I just quickly talk about the, um, what I think about the Belt and Road and how it can play in this part of the world? Now, clearly, the Belt and Road is about uh, bringing Chinese uh, expertise, Chinese businesses out into the emerging markets where the needs may be. I think today, China being one of the um, largest uh, renewable energy, country that uses one of the largest sources of renewable energy, uh, could well have the technology know-how as well as the R&D willpower to provide some of these uh, solutions that we're looking for in terms of providing renewable, renewable energy sources coupled with the fact that they do have enough financing muscles as well. I think that's something that is quite good to have in terms of bringing the availability of infrastructure to the areas of need. The challenge is, of course, uh, structuring the project and making sure that it is bankable and financially sustainable and viable over the longer term. I think this is where I think if we can work with them to bring in the necessary stakeholders to 
structure a project in a way that is viable, sustainable, I think that can bring both benefits to the Chinese company that are looking for opportunities and also for countries that are looking for a sustainable model of providing energy infrastructure. So I think this is where perhaps Infrastructure Asia office can play that role of bringing the people for that right conversation to take place. Uh, for the pan-Asian grid, um, it, is, it is a good idea to be able to increase connectivity and increase resilience across you know, different parts of ASEAN. But I think there are challenges involved because ASEAN is a whole big archipelago. It is not a single land mass. And I think the cost of linking up the countries through a pan-ASEAN grid has to be taken into consideration, not to mention that there are, of course, uh, policy harmonization that needs to occur as well. So it is a good idea, but ultimately, as Minister Yeo said, to the consumer, it is about how much I have to pay. And we can have grand ideas, but it has to become something that is affordable. There we go back to our trilemma all over again. Uh, let me just uh, give you a bit of a uh, Belt and Road update uh, on energy scene in Malaysia. We haven't been seeing much of the uh, uh, Chinese investment in energy scene, uh, whether it's in oil and gas or, or uh, I, I will speak on behalf of electricity. Um, but as we move into renewable energy, Malaysia welcomes all investment, whether it's Chinese investment or all across, that uh, eventually what we want is a level playing field for everyone who is competitive and is able to give us the best price um, and uh, for levelized cost of energy per kilowatt hour. That is what we are looking at and we are really aggressively looking into whichever investors are in, uh, interested in. On Pan-Asian uh, Greed, I just give you a little bit of update on Malaysian perspective. Um, we have just uh, um, had a uh, trilateral discussion with Laos, Thailand and Malaysia where we actually have confirmed a 100 megawatt of firm supply uh, through this, uh, these three countries uh, connected together. So initially we were voluntary, now we are on a firm supply regime. And I yesterday also have a, a, a bilateral meeting with Indonesia Energy Minister um, where we are actually looking into connecting Sumatra uh, with Malacca, uh, with Peninsula Malaysia, where we are connecting them uh, with a 600 megawatts of supply uh, by 2028. Uh, if earlier, it will be 2026. This, uh, and we are forming a task um, um, steering committee to look into that. So Malaysia will be connected to Indonesia through Sumatra and then Thailand and Laos and uh, we already have an existing line together with uh, Singapore. Uh, we hope that as uh, what um, Minister uh, Dr. Koh said, that eventually all this will have got to bring the best uh, for the people in our respective country and how can an interconnected pan-Asian uh, grid uh, benefit the uh, the people. From Malaysian perspective, it is easy because we are moving to renewable energy. That means more intermittency. With more supply from other people, and we can actually have a reduced reserve margin in our energy planning, electricity planning, and yet have a very good uh, uh, loss of loads uh, expectations. That means we have a reliable, affordable, and sustainable. That is how we want to use <coughs> ASEAN uh, to be able to, uh, ASEAN uh, grid to be able to solve our trilemma. First, we want to increase our renewable energy by going green. That means intermittency solving. Then we have interconnection. Second, we want it to be affordable. Uh, that is why uh, the reserve margin planning as well, we can reduce our reserve margin by connecting to the uh, neighbouring countries. And then third, of course, it's sustainable just by having a more uh, security uh, among the ASEAN countries. A question on gas? Well, uh, moving away uh, from oh, gas. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> as I stated in my paper earlier, um, Philippines is quite a, a different uh, situation. Our renewable is... Uh, high at the moment at 31 percent and uh, it comes with a uh, with a cost our electricity tariff is the highest in our region and um, that is one reason why investors are not coming uh, to the philippines so we ask our request ourselves now is that where are the people that are espousing uh, green energy uh, should they not locate at uh, philippines and support uh, green energy development so our problem is uh, access to energy for our country. So that's why we adopted the uh, uh, technology neutral uh, policy. And um, we, allow, we let technology compete, uh, of course, for the, uh, with, the, uh, with the emphasis on uh, cost. And 
renewable, to promote it, uh, we adopted the policy of the renewable portfolio standard so we can continue to uh, promote it, uh, keep it in pace with the development of the other uh, traditional uh, uh, sources. Now on thermal, on geothermal, we are one of the, uh, the first country, I believe, in the region to have explored and used uh, uh, thermal energy. And we are promoting that. And in fact, I was talking to uh, uh, some of our uh, guests yesterday in the, uh, in the conference on um, maybe we are going to uh, promote uh, uh, certain industry around the uh, uh, geothermal plant to save on uh, energy because we are using our thermal just to, uh, for electricity. So we're studying another source. Maybe we can use it, we can tap it uh, for uh, other, other usage. And uh, that's where, again, we are going to invite uh, uh, the investors to come to the Philippines. On the issue of interconnectivity, uh, well, PDR Lao, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore. Singapore, they're working on that already. Under the BIMP, Iaga, we're studying the connection from Sabah. Uh, to uh, an island in the Philippines, the Palawan. So we, we hope that we can import or bring in uh, ch cheaper electricity. But of course, again, for a developing country, uh, the cost uh, is always, uh, is always a, uh, a concern. On the question on gas? Uh, well, the tip for tat question was, um, I think the question was around the, um, the Chinese tariffs on U.S exported LNG. I think the short answer is in this global, um, e the global LNG economy, it's not going to make any difference at all. Um, I can elaborate later if you like, but I, I think it's a, an almost zero impact. Thank you. Uh, we're actually out of time, but I don't think we should end on this. I, sh I would <laughs> like to uh, give everybody uh, uh, one last question, uh, which it will be uh, something you can just respond with two sentences. <laughs> so for the ministers, I, well, actually for all of you, please imagine that you are walking on the beach one day and you came across this bottle, you picked it up, you opened up the bottle and out came this genie. And this genie came to ask you, will ask you, what is, it's going to give you two wishes. So for the ministers, what is your one wish for what the other ASEAN countries will do for you. Uncertainty. And then, one more wish is what you think the companies, maybe not necessarily just the companies here, can do for you. Okay? What, do you what do you want the other ASEAN countries to do for you? Uh, and what do you want the companies to do for you? That's for the ministers. Now, for the companies, your two wishes are what is the one policy wish that you think governments should act upon that will help your business? Of course, I think it's not about profits only, it's about how to make this energy transformation better. And the other wish that you can have from this genie is what would you want your other energy companies other than your own to do so that uh, your business can flourish? Okay, two sentences. We go in the same sequence as before. My two wishes are the same. Please work together to invest, innovate, and integrate to solve our trilemma. And we are happy. <laughs> uh, Secretary Kuzi. Well, um, the answer uncertainties, uh, of course, uh, the rising uh, oil price is uh, a big problem for the Philippines. Basically, uh, we have different policy. I think we are the only one that uh, uh, is uh, charging through cost and there is no government intervention. This is a free market and uh, this is an area that we are uh, looking at because our concern is, of course, accessibility, that's uh, equity and affordability. So you would like the companies to reduce the price of energy to you? Yes. And you don't have any demands of the other ASEAN countries. <laughs> <laughs> Prices are. Mr. Um, Yo. 
that, that is a very good question. Uh, it caught me by surprise. But uh, I thought that uh, I would like the ASEAN countries to work together. Actually, uh, ASEAN can be a very big force in terms of energy market as well, that we can work together not only to solve our energy problem, but let us just think that the energy player in this 650 million uh, market will be able to use this as their nurturing ground where they can actually capture the global market. I think that is my wish that we can actually work together to make ASEAN a place where innovative and competitive companies will choose to invest here and to be able to use this as a ground, a 650 million people market. Uh, as for companies, I think uh, I would just have a, 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 a wish is that uh, company continue to innovate because uh, the, the answer to all our energy is on technology, continue to innovate, con continue to be efficient, and of, above all, I think the most important thing is integrity, that company hold on to good value and to, to integrate and to, uh, to have integrity in their reporting and etc. And then the government will have no problem. Thank you. <laughs> Dato Lo. My policy wish is for governments to put a price on carbon because I believe that will drive decisions of businesses and consumers to choose cleaner energy. Because you know, once you invest in an asset, it's 20, 30 years, you're locked in. So you're locked into you know, something that's not as clean as uh, we would like it. And then for the other companies, my wish is for you to join us in exploiting more nature-based solutions to offset the carbon that, you know, invariably gets produced when people consume our products. Mr. Houston. Right, well listen, I have to agree on the carbon, the carbon points. I mean, if we're going to drive coal to where it belongs or clean it up, we need a carbon price. I agree that's a regional issue or it's a country by country issue, but it needs to be sorted. It has worked in the UK. I think in my country point, I'll stick to my, my, my theme of LNG. The LNG is a massively, um, overcapitalized and underutilized business. 50% of the ships are running empty 100% of the time. And you know, we need to do something about increasing the efficiency of the overall system. And I would hope for you know, increased cooperation around that, uh, mm. that desire. Mr. Tanti. Uh, to the governments, uh, basically, my wish would be that uh, if you could put some more bolder goals for renewable energy in your respective areas. I think <laughs> Philippines is a good example. Uh, but normally there are incremental goals which are capped, but if you make a more stronger, something like a 25% in coming uh, decade or something, then that would drive all that we are saying in terms of innovation and transformation and all that. Uh, so that would be my wish. And I think all the industry is there to make it happen. Uh, it's just that we need a level playing field uh, for the renewables uh, to get to that. And to, for my colleagues, basically, I would just say that uh, we are, uh, you know, in line with what you just mentioned, that basically we are willing to collaborate. And if you too can put a goal within your framework of Sky and whatever you guys are working on, uh, to have X percentage of renewables in your portfolio, because you are the conduit uh, to driving the power sector because of historical reasons, unless you also become champions of renewables, the transition wouldn't happen. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the panel for giving very good answers. Thank you.